We open on the outside of the Mitra University, where a high elf dressed in a blue suit with a pink tie is rehearsing his first lesson. The year is 1574. He gives a little fist pump to ensure himself and steps inside. He walks into his classroom, and soon several of Andresian's finest fills the room. He clears his throat a little and begins. Today, class, we'll begin with the first and second rise of Aqualia, and soon into its downfall. And he begins. Aqualia was founded by a subsect of the very young human race who sought to become equal with the other world powers of the time. What began as a laugh from the orcs, dwells, and elves soon turned into astonishment. Time after time, the humans succeeded in their conquests against a powerful beast that ruled the untamed land. Truly, their might seemed unreasonably unstoppable. As humans multiplied in the soon-to-be-conquered land, governance became a necessity. And thus, Martinia Melikai, the first human of record to fell an ancient dragon, was crowned as the first king of his name of the newly named Aqualia. This world gained a new superpower. Academics often argue why so much magic emanates from Aqualia. As everyone in this room should know, magic is a boundless force shackled by its duty to be used by anyone. This scarcity left the sentient races with a rather restricted use of magic in the times of human dominance. Yet there was a shift. Perhaps greedier creatures, now slain, released a previously untapped force in the world? Aqualia houses the forever sought-after origin point of magical force? Or rather, a new race of creatures, the humans, were now able to think, reason, and imagine freely. Thus, a new wave of conscious thought brings with it new potential. Regardless of the reason why magic pours from Aqualia, the once belittling races of orcs, dwar orcs, dwarves, and elves were now migrating there in droves. He looks a little nervous as he skips as he messes up that word, but continues on. Humans can be a peculiar race, however. Instead of basking in the ability to bring a newfound fortune to the world, they loathe their resources being used freely. Martinia and Melikai V brought about great suffrage amongst the non-humans, and while King Melikai the Ape tried to lessen the taxation, petty skirmishes, abasement of other race leaders, and the rare whispers of outright slaughter, this king, sadly, would, be, would soon be lost to sea. King Melikai the Ninth sympathized more with his great-grandfathers. Of course, Aqualia wasn't the only place humans settled in those early times. The indomitable Barebone Isle, the arid deserts of Shardy Sands, and of course, here, to the south, in Andaricina. While the Melikai line and their elk grew in isolation to the fellow creatures, the humans of the world did not. It would be a long while before the combined forces of a once lost princess and the grisly King Cool of Barebone Isle would meet and challenge the tyranny of King Melikai to thirteen. And thus the Salt War began. Thankfully for us, good won the day. A new kingdom was born. Princess that lost Princess Sakai, now in her mid-twenties, was elected by a small council of orcs, dwarfs, gnomes, and halflings to be their new king. Her plan of healing was an execution of simple attentions to mend complex issues. She gave every race a every race <laughs> excuse me. Every race a piece of the continental pie, pie to flourish for so long as they contribute their fair share. The once human-only capital city of Sanctuary was now redubbed New Sanctuary and open to all. She took several husbands and bore heirs of multiple races. She approved a foreign dark elf and his butler to move into a forgotten castle to further their noble pursuits. For thirty-four years, King Sakai, first of her name, has led Aqualia into a kingdom worthy of its name. The High Elf finishes proudly, looking around the room expecting applause. Some students cough, one of them is asleep. He realizes this is going to be a long journey.